Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Menschel. Uh, as Ms. Moore uh, mentioned, I'm a criminal defense attorney and president of Vital Projects Fund, a charitable foundation that gives grants to organizations that seek to end mass incarceration. To my mind, one of the clearest examples of reparations being implemented in recent years has been the social equity provisions enacted in a number of American states in the wake of marijuana legalization. While these provisions differ from place to place, they include things like one, the expungement of old marijuana convictions, two, special licensing regimes that provide economic opportunities to those previously convicted of marijuana offenses, and three, public investment in communities that were disproportionately impacted by marijuana criminalization. These social equity provisions are worth examining because I think they might provide a useful model for reparations for individuals and communities that have been unjustly criminalized and over-sentenced in other contexts. Generally speaking, when we make changes to the criminal law, we don't provide reparations to those previously convicted and sentenced under the prior legal regime. I think the fact that many jurisdictions have chosen to provide reparations in the wake of marijuana legalization is in part because we have an intuition that our prior marijuana laws were not merely imperfect, deficient, or warranting improvement, but rather because the laws were immoral, unjust, and enforced in a racially disparate manner. In other words, I think these reparation provisions reflect the fact that our culture has had a moral awakening with regard to marijuana criminalization, an awakening perhaps not unlike the moral awakening that accompanied the abolition of slavery and the end of Jim Crow. And we have a sense that that awakening creates an accompanying moral imperative, provide reparations to those who are victimized. I would further submit that if we look carefully at some of the other criminal justice reforms California has made in the past decade, there are other changes that might fall into this category where we might say that the reforms reflect not merely an effort to fix deficient laws, but rather a deeper moral judgment that the prior laws were cruel, unjust, and racist. And like with marijuana, we should consider reparations to individuals and communities unfairly impacted by those laws. So what are some of the reforms that may fall into this category? Here are a few worth considering. Number one, Proposition 36. In 2012, by a vote of 69% to 31%, Californians enacted Proposition 36 that amended California's draconian three strikes law. While other states had enacted these kinds of habitual offender laws during the 1990s, California's three strikes law was one of the broadest and harshest in the nation, providing for decades long mandatory minimum sentences for a third strike offense, even when that offense was nonviolent and exceedingly minor. Individuals convicted of petty thefts, like stealing a slice of pizza, a pair of white tube socks, or a pair of baby shoes, ended up with exorbitant decades-long sentences. Similarly, individuals convicted of possession of a single dose of heroin ended up with life sentences. In some instances, like a famous case where a man received a 50-year mandatory minimum for stealing five videotapes of children's movies, the third strike sentence for shoplifting was more than six times longer than the sentence that same individual would have received for rape. It is worth noting that California's three strikes law enacted amidst a media generated hysteria in the wake of the kidnapping and murder of 12 year old Polly Class has since been repudiated by Class's own sisters. They now call California's three strikes law a quote, pervasive injustice. They recently told Elle magazine, quote, it's difficult to describe how strange it is to be connected to this legacy of mass incarceration and then to carry the shame and the pain of that legacy. It's been heavy for us for a really long time. In short, even the people in whose name California passed its three strikes law have come to see it not just as a misguided policy, but as unjust and shameful. Number two. SB 1010. In 2014, California enacted Senate Bill 1010, which eliminated the state's crack cocaine disparity. Prior to the reform, California provided harsher punishment for the sale of crack cocaine 
than powder cocaine, and it made it harder for those convicted of crack offenses to qualify for probation. Similarly, a far smaller amount of crack cocaine than powder cocaine triggered the forfeiture of property used in drug-related commerce. It is now widely acknowledged that there is, quote, no scientific basis, close quote, for treating crack and powder cocaine differently. Indeed, California's 2014 reform law contained a legislative finding that crack and powder cocaine are, quote, two different forms of the same drug. The prior law produced dramatic racial disparities. 77% of those in prison for crack offenses were black, whereas less than 2% were white. Number three, SB 1437. In 2018, California enacted Senate Bill 1437, which amended the archaic felony murder rule and the natural, probable, natural and probable consequences doctrine, dramatically narrowing the circumstances in which people who neither kill nor intend to kill can be convicted of murder as though they were the actual killer. The reform bill recognized the inherent unfairness of pre-existing law and provided retroactive relief to those who had been convicted prior to the reform's enactment. Prior to the reform law, merely agreeing to participate in certain felonies made one strictly liable for any death that occurred. Thus, a person could be charged with first or second degree murder, even for homicides that one did not commit, did not intend, and did not foresee, and even those about which one had no knowledge. So people like Nico Wilson could be prosecuted for first degree murder in connection with the deaths of a couple during a robbery in the Central Valley, even though prosecutors conceded that Wilson had merely helped to plan the robbery and was not physically present when the robbery or the deaths occurred. In short, prior to the reforms, California law allowed people who were peripheral to felonies, lookouts, getaway drivers, and other minor participants to be prosecuted as though they were the trigger man in an intentional first degree murder. This law frequently ensnared people like women and youth who played a small role in the crimes of others. Indeed, 72% of the women serving a life sentence for homicide in California did not actually commit a homicide. England and other Commonwealth countries around the world that previously employed the felony murder rule have long since narrowed or abandoned it because it's archaic and produces unjust results. And indeed, the California Supreme Court itself has called the felony murder rule, quote, barbaric. In short, there is significant evidence that California's SB 1437 did not merely reform an imperfect law, but sought to end a pervasive injustice. Number four, SB 394. In 2017, California ended JLWAP sentences, that is, life without the possibility of parole sentences for juveniles. Prior to its enactment, California had more than 300 children serving such sentences, and California was one of just nine states that accounted for more than 80% of JLWAP sentences nationwide. Of the more than 3,000 counties in America, Los Angeles County, was the second most prolific user of such sentences. JLWAP sentences first became common during the 1990s at the height of what has now become known as the juvenile super predator panic. The panic was initially fueled by Princeton professor John DeLulio, who then seized on by politicians in the media who opined that a new generation of youth that had, quote, no respect for human life was going to drive a crime wave unprecedented in US history. In the coming years, juvenile crime didn't rise. In fact, it plummeted. For his part, DeLulio has since admitted he was wrong, expressed remorse, and joined a brief to the US Supreme Court repudiating his own work. As many have subsequently noted, the juvenile super predator panic specifically tapped into and amplified racial stereotypes, suggesting black children, sorry, uh, suggesting black children were predatory and prone to criminality. And in fact, among children arrested for homicide, black kids were twice as likely to be sentenced to JLWAP as white kids. In California, black youth were 18 times more likely to receive such a sentence than white youth. As the US Supreme Court has pointed out, the differences between adult and adolescent brains 
make adolescents less morally culpable than adults and render adolescents more capable of rehabilitation, making the irrevocability of a JLWAP sentence inappropriate. Indeed, brain science shows that adolescents are more susceptible to impulsivity, risk-taking behavior, and peer pressure, and less likely to weigh the consequences of their actions than adults because their brains are still developing. In California, more than half of the children who received the sentence did so as part of a crime with an adult, and in many cases, the child played a peripheral role. For these reasons, in recent years, more than 30 U.S. states have abandoned the practice of sentencing children to JLWAP in law and in practice, and the U.S. remains the only nation in the world that allows JLWAP at all. In short, California's SB 394 that eliminated such sentences might reasonably be seen as a moral awakening, not merely a practical change in the law. In conclusion, the four changes to the law that I've discussed are merely illustrative of a broader point. That as we look at the era of mass incarceration and begin to make reforms to the criminal law, some portion of these reforms will reflect an intuition that the laws being changed were not merely deficient or warranting improvement, but were barbaric, immoral, and unjust. And when a law falls into that second category, when we have a moral awakening, we have a moral responsibility to repair the harm we've done through reparations, like giving special economic benefits to people who were victimized and special economic investments into communities that suffered disproportionate enforcement. Thank you.